we were neither saints nor knights. We were simple Israeli boys who understood that we stand now for the Jewish people. You believed in something, you trusted in something that it must succeed. Because if you're going to fail, you don't fail yourself. You fail something much bigger than you. Soldiers are supposed to fight, kill, or be killed. And what we did as soldiers, we found dead people and we helped them to go back to life. We broke a taboo. We proved to the world that we can fight. We proved to ourselves that we can fight. The Jews can fight and they can win. April 1995. A group of World War II veterans arrives in the north of Italy from Israel. We were here 50 years ago. This was our battle. They have returned as old men to commemorate the Battle of the Senyo River, one of the last of the war in Europe. Somewhere 18, 19, I was well, not the oldest, with about 25. That's right. The Germans were on this side. I remember the actual crossing. As little known now as it was then, the Senyo is where these men fought the battle of their lives and still remember those they left behind. They served in the only all-Jewish fighting force in World War II, His Majesty's Jewish Brigade, part of the British Army, young volunteers from what was then Palestine who helped win a war, and in a larger way changed history. Their story begins before the war in the 1930s, when most had come to Palestine from a Europe rife with anti-Semitism had come with the dream of building a homeland of their own. Men like Shlomo Shamir, Chaim Laskov, Mayor Zaria, Avram Silberstein. I was born in Poland and I came at the age of, of 20 to Israel to study here. In Poland, you were a second rate citizen. The minute I reached Israel, I felt that I came home actually. The youth was free. There were no old men here, all young men. And they were dancing in the street. Food didn't mean anything, money didn't mean anything. It was a spiritual elevation. All you wanted is to do something for the country, not for yourself. We came to give and not to take. The desire of these young arrivals for a homeland of their own was frustrated both by the British, who ruled Palestine, and the Arabs, who had their own claims to the land. For the Jews in Europe, Hitler's rise to power in the 1930s made life even more dangerous. And there was no question about it, that the Nazis were the horrible enemies of the Jewish people. My parents were immigrants from Poland. My father left behind his entire family. Father, mother, ten brothers. So it was not a foreign thing to speak about Europe, about European Jewry. It was my family. Getting as many Jews as possible out of Europe and into Palestine became the urgent task of the Jewish agency, the political body representing the Yeshuv, or Jewish community in Palestine. Agency leaders like David Ben-Gurion and Moshe Sharet used this strategy to acquire more prime Arab land, build new settlements, and stake an ever stronger claim to a homeland. To the Haganah, 
the underground militia of the Jewish agency, fell the responsibility for defending these new Jewish settlements against anyone who stood in their way. Haganah members would later become the nucleus of the Jewish Brigade. In 1936, as Jewish numbers swelled to 400,000, almost a third of the total population in Palestine, the Arabs responded with an uprising against the Yeshuv and against the British. It took the British three years to crush the revolt. Fearful the Arabs would now side with Germany as Hitler threatened war, in May of 1939, the British stunned the Jewish community by issuing a policy statement, or white paper, canceling an earlier promise of statehood and severely limiting Jewish immigration to Palestine. With a single stroke of the pen, the British had cut off the escape route for those fleeing Hitler, dashed hopes for a Jewish homeland, and convinced agency leaders they would never have a Jewish state unless they fought for it. When I was uh, 13, around 13, and I was already a young member of the Haganah, so how did I think I am going to fight all those enemies? We used to go to the orchard and cut a branch, a lemon branch, because lemon wood is tough. And every one of us prepared a club and we trained, you know, in fighting. We didn't have a chance to train proper soldiering. It was illegal. You're not supposed to carry weapons. If you want to uh, drill yourself even for a simple drill, you had to do it undercover. If you want to teach people to deal with pistols or rifles or a machine gun, you dealt it in rooms or somewhere away, keeping guard that the British don't come and catch you in it. As the Yeshuv mounted resistance against the British and their new policy, the struggle in Palestine was about to be joined with a far greater one. World War II. It was a war that would forever change history for the Jewish people and for those destined to serve in the Jewish Brigade. With the onset of war, the Yeshuv in Palestine now had to choose between enemies. It was Ben-Gurion's phrase that we would fight against Hitler as if the white paper did not exist, and we would fight against the white paper as if Hitler did not exist. Honestly, uh, the fight against Hitler took preference. Anxious to join the fight, thousands of Jews in Palestine quickly volunteered for service in the British Army. In London, Heim Weizmann, leader of the World Zionist Congress, had something else in mind and appealed to his old friend Winston Churchill to establish a special all-Jewish fighting unit of 15,000 men from Palestine serving in the British Army as Jews, an opportunity to carry their own flag into battle, and as Weizmann secretly hoped, a symbolic first step toward achieving statehood. That flag had the value of what we are fighting for, our independence. To be recognized as a Jewish unit, as there were South African units and Indian units and all kinds of units. So we wanted to fight under our own flag. For David Ben-Gurion, the goal was more practical than symbolic an opportunity for the Jews in Palestine to get valuable experience in how to fight a regular war. One purpose was to get the training which the British Army was able to provide because some of us foresaw the necessity of a Jewish Army and the, which would need uh, trained officers. The British War Office, suspicious those officers would one day lead the fight against British rule in Palestine, had a more immediate fear, driving the Arabs into the Axis camp. They convinced Churchill to refuse Weizmann's request. Their overriding concern was not to offend the Arabs. And the easiest way to upset them is by having uh, Jewish uh, troops with their own identity and their own flag and their own nationhood uh, fighting uh, on behalf of the Allies. 
Throughout 1940 and 41, as Hitler's armies crushed everything in their path, Heim Weizmann in London and the Jewish Agency in Palestine kept the idea of an all-Jewish fighting force alive and pressed the British for its formation. The British continued to say no. In mid-1942, the Germans, under the command of Field Marshal Rommel, advanced across North Africa, reaching ever closer to Palestine. The British War Office, under pressure to free up more of its own troops to stop Rommel, allowed the formation of the Palestine Regiment, three full battalions composed of mixed Jewish and Arab units. The Haganah, sensing an opportunity, encouraged its men to join the regiment. We were all Haganah. We were sent by the Haganah to join the British Army. There was a danger here, or a real danger, of the Germans coming in. And we, we were sure that we could do much more if we were in uniform and we could get hold of legal arms and fight like soldiers. It turned out the British allowed us to get into the army in order to solve a problem with them, guard duties. Here we are, volunteering to the British Army, wanting to fight the Germans, prepared to fight the Germans, capable of fighting the Germans, but without the training, without the weapons, without anything. That was the thing that hurt us most. In November 1942, after months of fighting, the British defeated Rommel at El Alamein. The threat to the Yishuv was over. At the same time, accounts of the Holocaust became more widely known to the Jews in Palestine. Well, we started hearing stories about what Hitler is doing, slaughtering Jews, first in Germany and Poland and so on. And uh, we just said that, uh, I, I said that I just have to go out there and uh, kill as many Germans as I can, <laughs> period. But the Jewish soldiers in the Palestine Regiment were forced to remain in the Middle East, far from the actual fighting, more frustrated than ever. What were we doing? Guarding and training, training and guarding, you know? And in those days, we start to fight, uh, to establish a fighting, a real fighting force. So the first thing a fighting force has is a flag. So we put up our flag on the roof of the barracks. And our British colonists had to put it down. And we put up a guard around the flag that nobody would take it off. And that's mutiny. The British reacted quickly, disarming the entire battalion and sending the rebellious young Jews to a camp farther out in the desert. Our people sitting there in the desert were so discouraged that they asked to be transferred to different units. And uh, the Haganah didn't want it because we wanted that we should stay together for the Jewish brigade. In July 1943, the Allies invaded Italy. A year later, in June 1944, the D-Day invasion landed Allied troops on French soil for the first time since the war began. Heim Weizmann in London and leaders of the Jewish Agency in Palestine pressed Churchill for a last chance to have an all-Jewish fighting force to carry their own flag into battle against the Germans. Time was running out, and Winston Churchill knew it. September 20th, 1944, overriding the objections of the War Office and Colonial Office, Churchill rose in the House of Commons to make an historic speech, at last announcing the formation of His Majesty's Jewish Brigade. It seems to me indeed appropriate that a special Jewish unit, a special unit of that race which has suffered indescribable torments from the Nazis, should be represented as a distinct formation amongst the forces gathered for their final overthrow. Churchill, who gave it much importance, did not foresee that this decision created that missing link physically on the ground that eventually brought as a major item the creation of the Jewish state. But that was for later, 
For now, those who had waited the entire length of the war to have their own fighting force seized the moment and would make the most of it. The greatness of the history think that there's going to be a Jewish army which goes into the front against the Germans. And this was a terrific thing which everyone wanted to join. Hundreds in Palestine quickly signed up to join the Jewish Brigade. The three battalions of the Palestine Regiment, its ranks filled with Haganah members, became the nucleus of the new 5,000-man fighting force. For its insignia, the brigade chose not the traditional blue star of David, but the yellow. For years, a mark of shame to the Jews in Europe it would now be worn as a badge of honor. All brigade recruits were ordered immediately to Burg Al Arab in Egypt. We were all gathered in the Western Desert, and we had the first parade. And the Zionist flag was flown for the first time officially. And we all stood there, well armed, well equipped, and that flag in front of us, and this was something that moved everybody to tears. There was a, a, an incredible amount of excitement. We got uh, all new equipment, uh, jeeps, machine guns. So we, we had a feeling that we are going into combat somewhere, but we didn't know where. The British War Office appointed Brigadier E.J. Benjamin, a Jewish engineering officer from Canada as commander of the brigade. As for the Jewish officers from Palestine, none was allowed to serve in any senior staff positions. The British, not only from their political point of view, but from their military point of view, judging us, did not think that we are fit to command people. And uh, in fact, they thought, well, when it comes to the infantry, the queen of the battle, as we call it. We'll have to have a British officer or a sergeant to push them. Meanwhile, the Jewish agency appointed a parallel and covert Haganah command structure within the brigade to deal with things specific to the agency's political agenda. Its senior commander, Shlomo Shamir. The appointment was basically for the purpose if there is no contact with Israel, and decision have to be taken on the spot. And somebody has to weigh the thing, yes, no, and there is nobody to ask except God. In Berg al Arab, a month of preparation passed quickly. Then, with orders in hand, and surrounded by the vast silence of the Western desert, the brigade was given an emotional send-off by the Palestine Symphony Orchestra. All around, nothing, nothing, and nothing. And all of a sudden, you hear the symphony orchestra. And we felt high. This was an opening to our adventure. On October 31st, 1944, the brigade set sail by convoy for the southern tip of Italy. Upon arrival, the brigade was ordered up to Fuji, a mountain town outside Rome. Other Jewish units, already attached to the British Army in Europe, soon brought the brigade to its full strength of 5,500. In Fuji, training began immediately. For these young soldiers from Palestine, British regular army training, both in combat and logistics, was unlike anything they had had back home and gave them what David Ben-Gurion and the Jewish agency leadership had always wanted. We were given the discipline of the British army. The British Army has been in existence for over 400 years. It's served in 60, 70, 80 different countries in the world. So the British Army may not be the best army in the world, but one thing I can vouch for, it's a bloody good army. We had 
quite a few experienced British officers who were lent to the brigade in order to train the brigade in actual fighting. As good as these British officers were, they couldn't match the intensity of the soldiers of the Jewish brigade. I remember when we were training in Fuji, it was raining like hell. And word came down that the colonel said, no need, no need for training this afternoon, the, the weather is too bad. That was just the point that I was looking for. I said, fine, boots, socks, nothing on top. We're going for a five mile run. We're going into battle and we're gonna sit on our asses here for two or three hours this afternoon and not do anything. The colonel says you can sit in your ass. I can't sit in my ass. He is a Britisher and he's his relations are not being killed, and he's not a Jew being, 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 being smothered and, and smoked out and burnt and all the rest of it. The brigade brought that same intensity to life in the camp, where Fuji soon took on the appearance of the home they'd left behind. Ignoring British regulations, Hebrew was spoken everywhere, and the Star of David flew above. Where they could, brigade soldiers made time for Jewish refugees in and around Rome, especially children, sharing rations, holding weekly Sabbath services, and celebrating special Jewish holidays. The main holiday which we celebrated very, very much was the Hanukkah, in which we had uh, a terrific menorah put over our town where we were, could be seen for miles around, and every soldier dancing with a child on his shoulders. Really wonderful. You could have wept, but everyone had a child on his shoulders. During the winter of 1944 and 45, throughout the rest of Europe, the Germans were making their last stand against massive Allied attacks. In the north of Italy, the American 5th and British 8th armies were preparing the spring offensive against an entrenched German army. The Jewish brigade would be part of that final assault. On February 26, 1945, the men of the brigade were ordered up to the front. As their convoy passed through Rome, the city's residents joined hundreds of Jewish refugees to give them an emotional farewell, sending them off to the battle they had waited so long to fight. Five and a half years after the war began, and all through those years, we, Palestinians, Jews in the land of Israel, we wanted to be part of it, and we were never allowed, never given the chance. And all of a sudden, we are there. We are the front line. We had never experienced movements of such magnitude and positions taken against an enemy which is not the Arabs of Israel, it's a German army. <laughs> this you get into a war zone which you smell the air of big war. For most of March 1945, the brigade held their section of the static front line against the German 42nd Jaeger Division. This is your window to the war, and you had to prove yourself in these few months. We had our doubts whether we can stand up against the Germans in a face-to-face -face fight. They had such a reputation of soldiers. They put down all the armies of the entire world. One particular battle would be remembered by the men of B Company 3rd Battalion as their most severe test at a place called La Giorgetta. A German company had established itself on the high banks of the Faso Vetro Canal, overlooking the brigade's position. We couldn't move. We were pinned down to the ground with, by motors and machine gun fire. And it became necessary to scout the area, to find the minefields and exactly the approach and the, how many men are in La Giorgetta and so on. In one of my uh, patrols, 
I got right up to La Giorgetta. And I actually laid on a German bunker. And they had a record of a Lily Marlene. And they played it over and over again in German. And I learned Lily Marlene in German. I remember it to this day. Bei die Laterne, bei dem großen Tor, steht eine Laterne und steht sie noch bevor. Bei die Laterne, wir werden. Ta 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 ta. And with Lily Marlene, and with Lily Marlene. On the following morning, March 19th, Peltz's men carried out a daring daylight raid on La Giorgetta. On the starting line, we were all laying down, and there were bullets whizzing all around us and sounds of explosions. I pulled them up and charged. It's a, it's a fantastic feeling. A person loses all fear. It's a sort of a communal madness. Something, something grabs you and you just can't stop. I have never felt anything like it in my life. When we remind ourselves the ferocity of the front line, where the 200 yards between forces are 200 yards of death and life, and you had to pass your examination there, whether you're a soldier or not. This was very important for us, and we passed it. When we broke into the German positions, and we started sticking the bastards with pilots, one corporal, his name was Corporal Levy, during the assault, standing on the German bunker, shouted, Heraus ihr Schweine, die Juden sind da. Out with you pigs, the Jews are here. All of a sudden, I see a German soldier running, and another German soldier, and another German, and I have the feeling that the Germans are now attacking us. And I, I, I am all, you know, cold, and, and there is a Tommy gun there, and I take this Tommy gun, you know, and I, I prepare myself, you know, for the final, you know, fight. And then I realized that they are prisoners that we took. I saw them coming in, those uh, Nazis, which we have never met face to face. And we saw them coming, then we had suddenly the feeling, well, here they are. And Peltz wanted to kill them. He was running along with a Tommy gun and yelling, Verfluchte Jude, ver ich verfluchte Jude. And Uzi stopped him and he said, you, you've got an order to bring them alive. You can't kill them here. It was the first time, mind you, the first time that the Jewish formation, under its flag, went in the open day in battle and came back with a whole squad of German prisoners. When you put it in perspective, <laughs> It would have not made the big difference to take it in the British or the American or any other army. What's the big deal about? Ten prisoners? But to us, this was unbelievable. In late March, the brigade was ordered to another position along the front, where they would face the battle-hardened German 4th Paratroop Division. Their main task, hold the south bank of the Senyo River until the Allied spring offensive began. There are steep mountains coming up this way, steep mountains coming up this way. We were on these banks overlooking the Senyo River. The Senyo River is something like the Jordan River. It was very famous with us, but no one ever heard of it in the world. But that was a place where the Germans had made their last stand. The Germans were shooting from various positions. And then there was, of course, mortar fire and shells and so on exploding.
On March 26, in the middle of the action, the holiday of Pesach, or Passover, began, celebrating the Jewish exodus from bondage in Egypt. We brought the boys out from the forward areas in small numbers to give them some kind of a makeshift seder. We had some answers, so at least they could all say, well, we have had some kind of a Pesach, some kind of a seder. Sadly, we had casualties that night. We didn't live charmed lives because we were Jewish. The one above, I think he looked after us as best he could, but he had other people to look after as well. He, he was very, very busy. The situation along the front line intensified. We sent patrols every night. The whole terrain was extensively mined and covered with barbed wire. No man's land by day was dominated by a small group of, of eight or ten snipers. So we were sent out very much in front of the lines. When I saw a chance to fire, I did, and I could hit a target from 600 meters. Because I'm Jewish and I got to the front full of hate, I resolved ahead of time to hurt as many Germans as I could. So when I hit my target, it didn't bother me. On April 3rd, with the men dug in along the front line, the brigade received a surprise visitor all the way from Palestine, Moshe Charette of the Jewish Agency. In a formal presentation of the brigade colors, he had come at this final moment to honor his men and everything they were fighting for. This is a great moment in the life of every single one of us. We have attained the privilege of hoisting the flag of the Jewish people in the front line of the battle for the freeing of Europe, in this world war against the oppressor of the Jewish people. Long live the standard of Israel's war on the battlefield. Just days later, on the morning of April 10th, the Allied offensive began. We got orders, move. We are going across the Senior River. And there were minefields. And suddenly we heard a loud bang and yelling and screaming. One of the fellows had gone up on a shoe mine. And this poor fellow is brought down so that all of us could see his foot completely gone. And he's shouting, Hevle Nakama, revenge, revenge, revenge. And I went to the head of, the, of the, the column and I took them through the minefield, not because I was so bloody clever, because I was so damn lucky. And we came halfway up this thing near a place called Mount Jebbia. On the way, German snipers let us have it good and proper. There weren't very many of them. But you didn't have to have very many of them in order to the hold that line. Then we started left flanking, right flanking, until we got to the top of it, and then we carried on. But uh, we lost soldiers on that thing. Within days, the surrounding hills above the Senyo were taken. For these young soldiers from Palestine, though victory in battle was theirs, something even greater had been won. After the Holocaust, and after the fact that so many million Jews went to their deaths without fighting, I think that this is the most important facet of the Jewish Brigade. We broke a taboo. We proved to the world that we can fight. We proved to ourselves that we can fight. The Jews can fight and they can win. While the brigade held its position above the Senyo, the main Allied offensive swept on to the north of Italy, quickly overwhelming the enemy forces in its path. Two weeks later in Germany, with his last defenses crumbling around him, Adolf Hitler committed suicide. 
On May 2nd, after bitter fighting, Berlin fell. And on May 8, 1945, the Allies accepted Germany's unconditional surrender. The war in Europe was over. When the war ended, there was big rejoicing among all the fighting armies that fought the Nazis. Most soldiers knew that when they finished the war, everybody would go home. But for us, our war was just beginning. Even though we participated in the final defeat of Germany, for us, this was not enough. We had the feeling that this just didn't meet all the expectations that we had. On May 14th, the brigade received its new orders. We're heading north, supposedly to Germany. This was what we were told. We were sworn, you know, how to behave and so on and so forth. And we had the first encounter with a German division going into prison. And we hit them, we beat them, we did all kinds of things, and we were stopped at the border because of that, and we were never allowed to enter Germany. The brigade was sent instead to Tarvisio, a small Italian town on the Austrian border. With Europe in chaos and millions of people moving in every direction, the brigade was assigned to control those war refugees streaming into Italy from the east. Soon, these included Jewish survivors of the Holocaust. The meeting with the survivors was a shock, which is very, very difficult to describe, because first of all, everybody got some kind of information about the fate of his family and about the, the, the story of the Holocaust. The news went around that there were refugees there, there were, there were remnants of the Holocaust. People started running looking for maybe there'll be relatives, maybe there was somebody who knows something about somebody. This was a terrible thing, you know, because most of them didn't find anybody. But some of them find news. This one told, yes, I know I come from this little place and I know this family. And after that, people started to be absent from the units. They were going to look for the families. There were thousands that had families in Europe. So the urge to come out, search the family, find any remnants from your old little township was there. Desperate to learn what happened, increasing numbers of brigade soldiers found ways to circumvent British Army regulations and set out across Europe in search of family. I remember one evening, Brigadier Benjamin, who was the brigade commander, chatting to me in the mess over our, whatever it was, whiskey. He said, look, Benny, what are we going to do? All these soldiers are taking leave, but they're not coming back. What do I do? I said, well, sir, Put yourself in their places. The war's been won. Here they are doing guard duty or whatnot. All they are concerned with, and that's why really they joined up, is to see if they can find remnants of their own families in Europe. What we found was just bits and pieces. There were no communities. There were no families. There were individuals out of this horror, a six-year horror. When I saw the skeletons and I saw the people, uh, that's impossible to explain how do you feel when you're coming in into a place like that then. And uh, I lost all family in Europe. Well, the feeling of anger built gradually. It didn't come all at once. It came to the culmination 
when we heard of the extermination camps and when we found out from the survivors of the camp what the Germans in fact did. And then it turned not into an anger, but into fury. And the, everybody began feeling that we owe the Germans something. Secret vengeance squads began to form within the brigade to find, identify, and assassinate Nazi officers in hiding. It's something which you couldn't stop. It was not organized specially. I mean, there wasn't a cry out going along around the brigade. We were going to form a unit of revenge. This was all secret, very secret. We didn't keep any record, any written record. And that was for the purpose that if there is no record, nothing can be discovered. We had a group who were good in collecting intelligence and evaluating it. We were looking forward to see where are the, the real Nazis, SS, uh, they were commanders of, of camps. It was not easy to find them. We got information that in one house in Tarvisio is living a German, and they suspect him to be a Gestapo chief. We went to his house, and I told him that the, if we will find any weapons, is going to be shot on the spot. Israel Carmi ordered a search which turned up a pistol in the oven. The German officer, fearing for his life, prepared a list of other Nazis in hiding. And then another group came into action. Perhaps it's not a nice word, but that's what we were, executioners. A small group went out, found the man and killed him. One officer, two MPs, and two more people, they went into Germany, into Austria, with the address, exactly address, to liquidate him. Seeking out other Nazi officers, German-speaking Oli Gavan located a popular beer hall across the border in Austria. Posing as a Nazi officer himself, he entered. And I said to them, OK, I'm an SS officer. I'm looking for, how can I run away from here? Who is the connecting people? I'm alone, I don't know how. Gavon's ruse worked, and a secret meeting was arranged with a fugitive Nazi officer. Then I said, okay, we are now alone. I'm a Jew. You act against the Jews, you kill Jews. And I start to talk with them. And at the moment that I was 100% sure that he is the man who killed Jews, then they said, in the name of the nation of the Jews, I kill you, and I kill him. While vengeance squad activities continued, other brigade soldiers wrestled with their own anger, like the group escorting an army train into Klagenfurt, Austria. We come to a railway station. All the insignia, the Nazi insignia are still there. The manager of the station has torn this, but you can see, you know, it's still the shade, you, 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 the faded part, you know, you can see. And, uh, and we now, again, we now are going to revenge. We are now going to do the big thing. But what do you do? What do you do? We can throw him out of his office. We did it. We threw him out of his office, and we took over the place. Then we went out to, to town to see what can we do. And we could do nothing. What could we do? We couldn't just, you know, walk the street and shoot. What we could do is to look for Jews. And we arrived at a kind of a huge square with cobblestone, you know, and there, at the edge of this square, stood a young woman, and I can still see her, you know, dressed like in uh, Marlon Dietrich style, you know? A beret, a raincoat. And as we walked past her, in her eyes, we saw a different look. So after we passed through, one of us says, this girl, I think, is Jewish. She was indeed Jewish and led Bartov's squad to a group of other survivors huddled together in a bombed-out house. And we enter young Palestinians, 
and we say Shabbat Shalom, and they are all shock, at a shock, and we tell them that we are soldiers from Palestine, from the Jewish Brigade. And this was something <clears throat> which I think if I live a thousand years, I will not be able to forget because their reaction was as if they saw the Messiah. And they jumped, first of all, they didn't believe, then they started, you know, really physically, physically to touch us if we are real. You just cannot imagine what it meant for the Jews in Europe to see the Magen David on the sleeve of the Jewish soldiers. A rumor passed all through Europe that there are soldiers from Palestine. And if we go to them, if we reach them, or if they reach us, there is a future. One of those survivors was a young teenager, Moshe Beisky, liberated from a camp in Czechoslovakia on May 9, 1945, by a Russian officer, himself a Jew. The survivors turned to him for help. Now tell us, where should we go? And his answer I will not forget until my last day. And he said, don't go to the east because they don't like us there. But don't go to the west because they don't like us either. Now you see, the first day of liberation after five and a half years being in ghettos and camps, and the man who liberated you, he brings you the message that you have no place to go. I've decided not to return to Poland anymore because I knew in Poland was a big Jewish cemetery. And I had no hope to find anybody of my family. So we organized a group of 10 people who decided to make our way to the West. The small group joined what was known as the Briha, the spontaneous flight of Jewish refugees out of Central Europe. After walking nearly four weeks without a destination, Beisky's party found themselves at a refugee camp near the Austrian-Italian border. Here, they were approached by a man in uniform. He had a Magin David on his arm, and he said shalom, and he said in Hebrew that he was in the office of the camp. Then, he told us that on the other side of the border, there is a Jewish-Palestinian brigade. It's the first time that I felt, we felt, that there is a hope. Again, there is a hope. In this sense, the brigade kindled the imagination of survivors. And they came, they came running towards it from all over. We descended from Ayeta Hill, and we've noticed that there were trucks standing. And uh, uh, all of a sudden, uh, a soldier uh, came out, and we've noticed that he had an insignia with a star uh, of David. We cried, we, we screamed, we, we, we jumped, we, we kissed one another. <laughs> Can you imagine from, from the ghettos and the fires? to see um, Jewish uh, soldiers. Meeting like this acted as a generating power, as a kind of a huge dynamo to do more and more, because more and more you discover that you, you are not helping others. They are you, and you are they. Brigade soldiers quickly set up makeshift camps to care for the growing number of Jewish refugees headed toward Tarvisio. The picture of seeing the remnants go through the border, collecting in these camps, treating them, dealing them, the lists of names published that each one looks for his name, maybe you'll find his family there. This is a picture that doesn't leave you in your lifetime. The other activities were to provide, just to provide, to provide food, to provide clothing, to provide the dwellings. 
We became for them the light and hope. We became their fathers and mothers and the community, the rabbis and providers. Without us, I don't know what would have happened. We had a complete crisis that nothing actually exists in the world that it's worth to fight for and to live for. And how you meet suddenly with young people who weren't born heroes or who weren't born extraordinary persons, just simple people, and who go and fight for some. They believe in something. You see, this was actually all the young people who still were alive needed. We needed something to hang on. We were neither saints nor knights. We were simple Israeli boys who understood that we stand now for the Jewish people and we have to do something about it. While the brigade cared for as many Jewish refugees as they could, the vast majority were living in allied displaced persons camps established after the war. Here, grouped together with all other refugees, Jews had no identity of their own. You know that uh, after the war, in the DP camps, there were no Jews. That's what the British and the Americans said. They were all displaced persons, they were no Jews. At the beginning, the Jews were not considered a, a, a group. They were Poles and Hungarians, Romanians, whatever it is, by the countries from where they came. Burdened with an overwhelming number of war refugees, the Allies enacted their policy of repatriation for all displaced persons, including the Jews. Eisenhower came out with the announcement that every refugee will be sent back to the country of, of his origin. And that was impossible. That was impossible. They came home, but there were no homes and there was nothing. There were no parents, no brothers, no community, no rabbi, no teachers. There was nobody to tell them what to do or how to make a new start. Many times at their home, there stood a Gentile neighbor with a knife in his hand who wanted to inherit and keep their home as his own. So they had to leave. Frequently they waited for days, hoping that perhaps somebody would come, perhaps a brother, perhaps another survivor, perhaps somebody who knew something. There was no mail, no telephone, no communication. There was no place to go. We understood the situation. We understood that, that Europe, for the Jews, is finished. On June 20th, 1945, an official brigade search party, led by Captain Aron Hoder Yushai, was sent out on orders to learn more about Jews in the camps, where they were and how many. At the first camp, Hoder Yushai was told by the commanding officer that there were no Jews. But searching throughout the camp, his men did find Jews, hundreds. I ran back to the office of the camp commander, and I burst out without taking care of the difference of our ranks. And I said, why did you tell me there are no Jews? He told me we are having the whole repatriation moving in a full scale. I'll have to report numbers of in, numbers of out. So how could I know that there are Jews? Here we have the names of the country. You are not a nation, and therefore you don't appear on my board. Outraged at the status of Jews in the camps, Hoda Yashai and others involved in refugee work began pressuring the Allied command to give Jews their own identity, exempt them from repatriation, and provide them with camps of their own. But even that, when it happened, would not be enough. 
For the men of the brigade, the only real answer to the plight of Jews in Europe was Palestine. The Americans, when they went into Dachau, and the, the British, when they went into Bergen-Belsen, and witnessed with their own eyes what had been done, we expected that from now on, the white paper of 1939 would be canceled, and that one way or another, a Jewish commonwealth would come into being, at least in as much as the free Jewish immigration to Palestine was concerned. But the white paper was not lifted, nor was the British blockade put in place to prevent any Jewish refugees from reaching Palestine. The men of the brigade were no longer willing to sit back and wait for the British to change their policy. Taking advantage of a continent still in chaos, the brigade's Haganah leadership, sometimes acting on their own, sometimes under orders from Palestine, took matters into their own hands. As we did not have a formal sovereignty, country, president, government, ta -ta -ta, army, the whole, the whole structure, this inspired everyone to fall in into an authority which is actually undefined, but it's in the air. Mind you, let me put it straight now, we were not the only ones. I think American Jews, English Jews that were fighting, and non-Jews, they were all giving a hand, and it would have never happened between without their help. For moving Jews out of Europe, however, the men of the brigade realized they were the best hope and put their clandestine operation to work. A kind of a freedom train formed itself, and everywhere they used the logistics of the army, the fuel, if need be, we stole whatever we could lay hand on, and the whole machinery was geared to one thing, to bring the Jews to take them south, as near as possible to Palestine. The first of our tracks went through Austria to the camps. I left the convoy and went into the camp and said, we're here, look here, the week's time, we are going to pick up our thousand people from you. The reaction of the inhabitants of the camp to this yellow Again, the read word, it's extraordinary. Finally, somebody cared for them. And who cared? Jewish soldiers. For morale of those people, was just something extraordinary. The only way that you could move them, the only way that you could organize them, was by utilizing, exploiting the British Army. We had no alternative. We cheated, we lied. We stole, we crooked. What didn't we do? If you have to tell a man to do something illegal, you don't order, you tell him that this is what is required. Because in such case, every soldier will think, will consider, will weigh like a general. You, you believed in something, you trusted in something, that it must succeed. You can't fail. Because if you're going to fail, you don't fail yourself. You fail something much bigger than you. We had every facility or every service of life, from the womb to the tomb. We stole uh, blankets, beds, medicines, milk, chocolate, and we had a net over the whole of Europe, which was then uh, about five million people were moving from place to place of all nations and denominations. And we directed our streams towards Palestine. To run an operation all through Europe with hundreds of people out of their units with false passes. This required an organization, a system, a control uh, that, uh, that really succeeded. It had to be done in a way that the British will not notice it. 
that the normal activities of the brigade will continue. And at the same time, underneath, there will be, so to speak, a second brigade doing other things. They have actually formed an imaginary formation. They called it the TTG. TTG was just, you know, a combination of dirty words in Arabic and Yiddish combined. The original name, TTG, meant Tilhas Tizi Geschäften. Roughly translated will be up my ass business. <laughs> and all papers were found TTG. Uh, the British, like any other bureaucracy, they love initials and they love different colors of inks. If you had to fold the document, you preferably you had three or four different colors. You should fill out the work ticket that you're going from wherever it is, Frankfurt to Rome, and you've got to give the reason for the, for the journey. And you put down that TTG and you sign a signature and after that you put captain or lieutenant and all the rest of it. And you stop 20 times on the road. And the fellow asks for your work ticket, you show him the work ticket, and you've got to be very sure of yourself. You show it to him with a smile on your face as if you own the bloody world. You and Churchill are chums. And he says, TTG, what's that? You don't know what TTG... Ha! Huh. He doesn't know what TTG means. He's... That's, all, that's all you need. We were very careful to disguise everything possible. If there was an inspection in the unit, everybody was present there, cover up proper. If transport was involved, cover up proper. In that sense, I think we played it very well, reasonably safe, reasonably, not all the time. For the, for the cases where we didn't play safe, we very much required God's help, and he did help. Divine intervention or not, what made these deceptions even more disturbing to the British High Command were individual British Jewish officers within the brigade who, by turning a blind eye, allowed these capers to continue. So many of my men were away that when we were inspected, it was quite difficult to produce the requisite numbers. And uh, there was one occasion when uh, there was a man called Heller, who was a sergeant. Uh, and he had his cap on one way, like that, and uh, he spoke to the general, and then uh, when he went down to the cookhouse, there was him again with his hat on that side. Uh, and he said, haven't I seen you before? Uh, no, sir, you see my twin brother. We carried out our military duties correctly, our other duties we did as best as we can to reconcile them. I don't regret any of the things. I mean, I remember that when they gave a party for me when I was being demobilized, they said to me, David, we're sorry you're going. Your signature was so easy to copy. <laughs> Some officers, like Shaul Ramati, actually took part in covert operations, putting themselves and their careers on the line. One day, special investigation branch, a captain came to see me and told me very indignantly that they had caught two of our trucks with people aboard and that I was signed on the work ticket. So I said, well, yes, that's my signature, all right. And then he said, well, this is no behavior, not the kind of behavior we expect from a British officer, because I was in the Gordon Highlanders attached to the brigade. And um, I said, well, you should expect something like this because, you know, my mother was murdered in the Warsaw Ghetto and uh, nearly all my family was destroyed there. And you can't expect me to sit here with folded arms, not yet even to try and do something to save those who have survived. Desperate to reach more survivors, the men of the brigade took greater and greater risks. One of their boldest operations targeted more than a thousand Jewish refugees in a holding center in Graz, a town in central Austria under Russian military control. I got information through our people that were walking there that uh, the Russian army is withdrawing and the British army is coming in into Austria. Sensing an opportunity to transport more Jews than ever, 
Israel Carmi and a few others arranged for a convoy of 30 brigade trucks to slip into Graz after the Russians had left, but ahead of the British. We met the first advance troop of the British forming near the, uh, near the road to advance to Graz. Hiding their trucks in a nearby forest, the brigade soldiers headed into town. With little time to spare, they located the refugees and quickly got them together. When they were told that we were taking them out to Italy, they, you know, they were shocked, absolutely. The thousand refugees were led into the forest and onto the waiting trucks. At nightfall, the brigade convoy carefully picked its way south, back towards the Italian border. If the British would have been more sensible, stopped the trucks and arrested the whole law, there would have been a scandal up all the way to, God knows, to the sky. Thanks God, God kept us in good spirit. It was a, a very daring move. Thanks God, achieved. Throughout the chaotic summer of 1945, taking full advantage of their unique position as soldiers, the brigade managed to transport thousands of Jewish refugees to ports in the south of Italy and France. There they boarded ships that would attempt to run the British blockade of Palestine. Most were unsuccessful, either turned back or their passengers sent to detention camps in Cyprus. Increasingly aware of the brigade's activities and their flaunting of authority, the British War Office took action. On July 27, 1945, the brigade was removed from its strategic position on the Italian border. They took the Jewish brigade away from Italy mainly because of Bricha. They sent us over to the Western Front, to, to, to Netherlands, because they reasoned that from there we would not be able to be so much involved in the Bricha and in the organizing of the Jewish underground in Europe. Traveling north out of Italy, the brigade convoy had to pass through occupied Germany. For the brigade to be going through the territory of the conqueror, you know, the, the people who, who were going to wipe out the Jewish race completely, they were going to wipe us out. People came out of the ruins in Mannheim and looking at, uh, unbelievingly at us. Uh, Jews, there aren't any left. We were able to disprove that quite quickly. The brigade arrived in Belgium on August 1st, 1945. Some units moved on to Holland. Now under greater scrutiny by British command, the brigade was forced for the moment to curtail its covert activities. In the meantime, the men took relish in performing their official duties, guarding German prisoners of war, and sending them out daily to clear the minefields planted by their own army. This was another feeling. You, suddenly they were the one who, who took orders from us. Each one of them and all of them would say, we were never Nazis, we were made to serve in the army, we had to obey orders, we never killed the Jews. We fought against the Allies, we didn't fight against the Jews. We didn't believe them, we didn't trust them. We knew that they had to say this because they were afraid. Angry at what they heard, these young Jewish soldiers designed a special punishment for the POWs. We took a detachment of German prisoners under guard to clean the main synagogue in Harlem. And they cleaned it tip-top like what we call bullshit cleaning of the British Army, till it shone the whole thing. We put them to work for the Jewish community in Harlem to clean all those synagogues that they made dirty and they closed and some of them they destroyed. Meanwhile, brigade leaders worked out the logistics of running their covert operation from this new location in the north. Nothing could be done without transportation. I mean, when we, when we had to supply these survivors with food, we needed transportation. When we moved the survivors from one place to another, or to our camps, we needed transportation. Further than ever from the main refugee escape routes to the south, additional trucks had to be found. 
For this, Avram Silberstein and his men developed a plan. I saw that the British were forming a new Dutch army, and they gave them the same trucks as we had. I went back to my unit and I said, we are going to steal 34 trucks. And we shall give them the same numbers as our trucks. And we shall make a separate unit. We shall have two units with the same numbers, with the same markings, in two separate places. Within two weeks, there was panic in Holland. 34 trucks were stolen from them, and we kept them separately. They had the same papers. Everything was correct, and the British couldn't find us. We were shifting daily our trucks to Germany on false papers. The refugees were dressed up as soldiers, and as soldiers, they were coming back from the concentration camps. I had Belgian friends that gave me a farm, in that farm, we reloaded our men, we changed the dress, they became civilians, and from now on, over the French border, we shifted them as workers. The brigade continued operations like these throughout the summer of 1945, moving groups of Jewish refugees whenever and wherever they could. But with tens of thousands spread throughout the DP camps in Europe, they were in far greater numbers than the brigade could ever hope to reach. In September, under mounting pressure from Jewish leaders everywhere, the Allies agreed to establish separate camps for the Jewish refugees and granted them their own status as a distinct group. Sensing an opportunity, David Ben-Gurion, newly arrived in Europe, joined the brigade leadership in developing a bold new plan. First, pack 100,000 refugees into these new camps and then, to further pressure the Allies for a Jewish homeland, send brigade soldiers into the camps to transform the refugees into a single Jewish voice demanding entry to Palestine. We sent our people to the camps to organize the younger and the older to teach them Hebrew, to teach them how to use a rifle and the, and the gun and the revolver, to Jewish history, uh, Israeli geography, to get to know the country, to get them closer and closer to the idea of choosing Israel as the aim where he should go. We call it indoctrinate, but tell the story. Tell the story about the Yeshuv, what there is in Israel. That there is a population here, there are towns, there are villages. They were proud of us that we are the representative of a future Jewish state. They met us as Jews who are going to give them a real life. When the members of the brigade came, as emissaries of the Haganah to organize us into the movement, we immediately uh, took a liking to them. And when they started singing with us, and when they started dancing with us, we felt, my God, they are different, They're singing the same songs. They, they are somehow uh, taller than us. We, we straightened out and we started singing like the, them with more gusto with the real Hebrew. We felt suddenly we belonged to, uh, to our own people, belonged to our own kind, but with pride. Despite the hopes of the refugees, the door to Palestine remained shut, and the British blockade stayed in place. For the leaders of the Jewish agency, it was time to accept the inevitable. There would be no Jewish homeland unless they fought for it. Knowing they lack sufficient arms and ammunition for this confrontation, the Jewish agency used whatever methods necessary to secure what they needed. For special help, they turned to the men of the brigade. You have to visualize Europe 45. It's a huge military depot. There are millions of soldiers there. And the amount of equipment and food and everything that is being shipped to Europe is 
endless for soldiers who are organized in transport companies and engineering companies, military organizations who enable them to move around and have access to these huge depots. It was easy to do. You like asking a child who's in a toy shop, do you didn't touch any of the toys? How can you take a child into a toy shop and he won't touch the toys? You take a Jewish soldier from Palestine and into, into Europe and you guard stores with, and then all the arms apart from the man the man was carrying were all in stores. Who looked after those stores? We looked after those stores. Snipers, rifles and rifles and blah, 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 guns and blah, blah, blah. Of course, we guarded them, we stole them. We had, of course, links with the Haganah and the arms and the ammunition taken away from the British were very valuable later on. The British intelligence knew a lot, but not enough. This is the great secret. They knew that we are smuggling arms, they knew that we are dealing with immigrants uh, moving here, there, but they never dreamt the magnitude of the operation. Because in their interpretation, they couldn't grasp it this way, with all due respect. They couldn't grasp the, how the thing really <laughs> was managed. The British were also unable to stop it. And after nearly a year of trying, took the only action they could. In April 1946, the Jewish Brigade was ordered out of Europe. When the order for the disbandment came, the uh, British authorities acted very quickly because the disbanding of the brigade was a political move. It wasn't a military move. The brigade was the, the force that kept the Jewish refugees then close to the idea of Zionism. And therefore, they decided to disband it. Knowing their days in Europe were numbered, Haganah leaders within the brigade hatched a daring plot to leave behind more than 100 soldiers to continue their covert activities with Jewish refugees. To camouflage this final deception and in the process smuggle more refugees into Palestine, survivors were chosen to take the place of the soldiers and assume their identities. Each one of us got a double and we were sitting with the doubles for many, many hours to tell them about our family and the address and all small details that they will be able to pass through a, a, a simple checking of the military police. We had to train them to, to look like soldiers, to salute, to knew a few things in English. They wore British uniforms. They were, they were looking like soldiers, like us. Those brigade soldiers who stayed behind continued their work with survivors, strengthening the link between the ruined world of Europe and hope for a new life in Palestine. While in July of 1946, the last contingent of brigade soldiers set sail for home. What we did in terms of presenting a new hope to the survivors was a tremendous thing. It changed, in a way, the direction of Jewish history. We are very proud of what we did in Europe, but my main feeling is that we did too little, too late. But who could cope with such a magnitude of, of the Holocaust. We did our best, that's all. Two years later, in 1948, Israel fought its war of independence. As David Ben-Gurion had anticipated years earlier, the former officers and men of the Jewish Brigade, with their unique military experience fighting a large-scale war, were called upon to help organize, train, and lead Israel's fledgling defense forces against armies of the five surrounding Arab nations. Ben-Gurion was very much for the brigade. He realized 
that unless you get the experience of a regular army, you'll look like partisans. And if there's a real war going on, a war against armies of Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, you had to have somebody who knows how to fight an army. It was the Jewish servicemen of the British army who had the know-how, how to run an army, how to build their army, how to organize it. With the British blockade now lifted and the hated white paper no longer in force, Jewish refugees poured into Israel and soon swelled the ranks of the new army. Many were trained by and fought alongside the very same members of the brigade who had earlier in Europe made them a solemn promise of a homeland of their own. That promise would now be kept, kept for the new arrivals and for the men of the brigade themselves, fighting a war that would bring them a new nation. If there is a claim to the meeting of the remnants of Europe, the major claim is survival. So survival of the people as people, survival as a group in terms of a state, of a homeland of their own, survival. We had the inner feeling that we are able to do it, that we are able to defend ourselves, that we are able to acquire this piece of land for ourselves and, and the remnants. Could it not have happened? It could not have happened, but it did happen, and we are here.